Now it is my honor to introduce Mr. Cummings, uh, who will then introduce Mr. Sherwin. Bruce Cummings is the Gustav F. and Ann M. Swift Distinguished Service Professor in History at the University of Chicago and the former chair of the university's history department. Mr. Cummings' body of work explores modern Korean 20th century, excuse me, modern Korean history, 20th century international history, East Asian political economy, and American foreign relations. In addition to his work at the university, Mr. Cummings has traveled the world and is the author of The Origins of the Korean War, War and Television, Parallax Visions, Making Sense of American East Asian Relations, Dominion from Sea to Sea, Pacific Ascendancy and American Power, and many others. It is my pleasure and honor to once again welcome to the Stevenson Center on Democracy, our longtime friend, Mr. Bruce Cummings. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you and with uh, uh, Marty Sherwin. Uh, professor Sherwin is the University Professor of History at George Mason University uh, and taught for 27 years uh, at uh, Tufts University. He is uh, the author of American Prometheus, uh, a book on Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the uh, Atomic Bomb. He wrote that with uh, our mutual friend Kai Bird, uh, and it won uh, the 2006 Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle uh, Award. Uh, he is also the author of uh, his first book, is A World Destroyed, The Atomic Bomb and the Grand Alliance, which was a finalist for both the National Book Award uh, and the Pulitzer Prize. I, I could go on talking about Marty, but I'd like to tell a couple of stories uh, about uh, Marty. Uh, I started my teaching in 1975 at Swarthmore uh, College. And um, across the hall from me was a professor whose uh, scintillating intellect was well known to everybody, uh, an intimidating uh, professor to say the least. In fact, he liked to intimidate people with his intellect. Uh, and I was a little bit worried about him, but uh, when we first met, he said, well, what are you reading these days? Uh, in his typical domineering manner. And I said, well, I'm reading Marty Sherman's book, A World Destroyed. And he said, oh, I just read that book myself. Uh, and we got into a discussion of it and uh, we have been close friends ever since, uh, going back all the way to 1975. Uh, that book, A World Destroyed, if folks haven't read it, please, get a copy and read it. Among other things, it shows how Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, who was widely thought to be somewhat naive when it came to foreign affairs uh, and national security, the minute he got word that an atomic bomb was feasible, he understood its uh, political value. Uh, and that's one of the major conclusions uh, of the book. Uh, also in my first year of teaching at that college, uh, I gave a lecture where, among other things, I said that Sherwin's book shows that the bomb, the second bomb on Nagasaki was gratuitous at best and genocidal at worst, uh, which is not actually, as I recall, something that Marty says in the book, but I think in a preface, whoever wrote that preface, it was implied. Well, I actually had a professor, a senior professor pounding on my door saying, what's this bullshit? that you told your class. And I, at Swarthmore, I just couldn't quite believe this would happen. But anyway, um, and my, one of my favorite stories is from Marty. He showed up at the University of Washington to do some research uh, when I was teaching there. Uh, and he told me a story that uh, Robert Oppenheimer got on a plane to Portland, Oregon. Uh, to give a lecture uh, at the uh, University of Oregon and the University of Washington. He got off the plane and uh, heard two pieces of news. One, University of Washington had disinvited him 
uh, because he was a security risk to all those people in Seattle. Uh, and two, Albert Einstein had died uh, while uh, Oppenheimer was en route to Portland. So uh, I have to say Marty uh, hasn't stayed away from very difficult <laughs> topics uh, in his career. Uh, and I don't have any criticism uh, of the new book, uh, Gambling with Armageddon. It's one of the best books I've ever read on, maybe the best on crisis uh, decision-making uh, within the government. Uh, it's also remarkably well-researched. And I, I just wondered if I could turn it over to Marty for uh, a short uh, um, discussion of, of how he went about his research for this book, which is just full of primary materials, many of which had, had not been used before. Well, thank you, uh, Bruce, for those <laughs> stories, which reminded me of uh, uh, many good times. Uh, I, I would say I went about the research um, uh, tenaciously and slowly, <laughs> which is the way I do things. Um, I started this book in 2007. Uh, so it was, what, 13 years or something like that, which for me is fast since the Oppenheimer book took 25 years. <laughs> um, but uh, it was a process that uh, you're uh, uh, familiar with. Um, you go to all the presidential libraries that are relevant. Um, you uh, search the internet, uh, which is really fantastic. I mean, here I could uh, sit at my in my office and read all of these um, uh, 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 interviews uh, at the Kennedy Library, at the Johnson Library, uh, at the Eisenhower Library. Uh, uh, there was a lot of CIA material that was online, but I think the the most important archive for me, uh, besides the Kennedy Library, uh, was the National Security Archive at George Washington University, uh, which if uh, listeners are not familiar with it, it sounds like a government institution, but uh, that's it's sort of a chung in cheek title. Uh, the National Security Archive is a wonderful organization run by Tom Blanton that uh, 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 methodically applies the freedom for the for documents through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, and uh, it, it's it's really quite wonderful. Uh, so. Yes, the, the National Security Archive uh, is great, and it has the uh, virtue of not being afraid to declassify materials. Uh, Nicholson Baker, a friend of mine, uh, recently wrote a book called Baseless uh, about the possibility that the US used uh, germ warfare in Korea uh, during the Korean War. Uh, he doesn't come to a real conclusion on whether it did or not, but about half the book uh, deals with how difficult it is to get documents out of the government through the Freedom of Information Act. And when you get one, often it's uh, so much of it is blanked out. So uh, the National Security Archive is, is a real uh, national treasure. Uh, let me ask you about the very first uh, thing you say in your new book, uh, which is a couple of pages about luck and how luck played uh, a role in, in um, maybe the key role in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yes, uh, one of the major themes of the book is uh, uh, the role of luck. And uh, it's uh, highlighted uh, by uh, some of the first few chapters where I tell the story of uh, this, a Soviet submarine that was on the uh, blockade line during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the ASW, the anti-submarine warfare <coughs> uh, forces uh, were dropping depth charges uh, around this submarine, trying to get it to surface. 
They weren't trying to uh, destroy it. They were trying to force it to the surface. But the captain of that submarine uh, was convinced that they were trying to uh, kill his submarine. <laughs> and he had a nuclear torpedo on board, which the United States had no idea that these Soviet submarines carried a nuclear torpedo. And he uh, uh, said, load the, load the torpedo. We're not going to be the, the, the um, uh, the, uh, we're not, uh, how did he put it? We're not going to be the disgrace of the Soviet Navy. Uh, we're going to, we may die, but we're going to take them with us. And the torpedo is getting ready to be loaded. And he would have taken out uh, a U.S. aircraft carrier with 4,000 uh, sailors on board, uh, probably in a, a few uh, of the uh, destroyers also. Uh, but at the last minute, uh, another officer of the same rank, uh, Vasily Arkhipov, uh, who was a member of the uh, staff who was put on board simply by chance, by luck, uh, a much cooler head. And Akhapov, uh figured they are not trying to destroy us. They are simply trying to get us to come to the surface. And he managed to talk uh, Captain Savitsky out of loading that torpedo uh, and uh, really starting a nuclear war uh, that would have uh, had terrible consequences, of course. There also was an episode that I had never heard of uh, uh, in Okinawa with an American. Uh, why don't you tell that story too? Because that's another lucky break. Yes. Yes. Well, this story, uh, this is I an interesting story. And I had a debate with myself about whether to uh, include it because uh, there's not quite enough confirmation. Uh, but here's the story. Uh, there were American um, uh, uh, missiles on Okinawa aimed at both China and the Soviet Union. And uh, on Friday night, uh, on no, on Saturday night, um, the 27th of October, the night before the crisis ended, uh, the uh, crew on one of the crews on Okinawa received a message saying, uh, fire these missiles. And uh, it's a long, complicated story, but uh, the senior officer in charge uh, looked at this message and he noticed that China was being targeted. And it said, why would China be targeted? What do they have to do with this crisis we're in? And he managed to um, uh, hold off the orders. Uh, he refused to allow the other um, uh, 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 missile uh, captains to fire their missiles. And, uh, and really, again, uh, saved uh, the possibility of uh, a, a nuclear war. So, you know, we were lucky that these people quite by chance were in the positions they were in. And one of the luckiest uh, by chance uh, associations has to do with Adlai Stevenson. Um, uh, Adlai Stevenson was ambassador to the United Nations uh, during the Kennedy administration. On October 16th, the day that Kennedy was informed uh, that the missiles were in Cuba, just by chance, Adlai Stevenson had a luncheon appointment in Washington uh, with the president. And after the first uh, 
meeting of Kennedy's advisors that he brought together to figure out what to do in response to these Soviet missiles. Um, uh, after that meeting, uh, at which everybody, including Kennedy, concluded that they were going to have to invade Cuba or bomb it or both. Uh, after the luncheon that Stevenson had arranged weeks before with the president, uh, Kennedy took Stevenson upstairs and showed him the photographs of these missiles. And he said, well, we're probably going to have to bomb or invade to get rid of these missiles. And Stevenson instantly said, no, this is not the way to do it. Uh, we can do this diplomatically. Uh, there are these missiles in uh, Turkey, which we you know, all agree are junk. Uh, they can be negotiated. And Stevenson, in the course of that luncheon conversation, in effect, provided the blueprint for how the Cuban Missile Crisis could be ended uh, without going to war. And we know this because the next day he sent a memorandum uh, to Kennedy summarizing what he said. And uh, that was just absolutely lucky. And Kennedy ended up following that blueprint, although he never admitted that Stevenson had any significant role in changing his mind from invasion to a dipl <clears throat> diplomatic solution. I have to say that was one of the most compelling parts of, of your book because Adlai Stevenson had been slandered uh, as weak and uh, so on from 1952 when he ran for president onward. Uh, and you basically show that uh, Kennedy took Adlai's uh, advice and his plan and then called it his own. Uh, you also, and, and I actually don't know so much about this myself, uh, but uh, you say that JFK never liked Stevenson. Uh, and so this is even more uh, serendipitous that uh, he didn't break the lunch appointment, for example, uh, but went forward uh, with it. But it, it's, it's a very interesting story. And it, it's a harrowing story because at several points in your discussion, as, as you just indicated, almost the entire executive committee or the entire exec, executive committee, including uh, uh, also the president, were ready to uh, attack. They had timetable for next Tuesday or whatever it was. Uh, and uh, I, I was I want to say some more about that or ask you more about that in a minute. But I was kind of appalled at the advice that uh, Kennedy got from even from, you know, so-called wise men like Dean Acheson. Uh, yes. Uh, well, Dean Acheson was one of the super uh, hawks. Uh, yeah. There's a, an interesting story at one point <clears throat> when Acheson is invited in, he said, listen, I know the Russians, the only thing they understand is force. And um, uh, we, we, uh, we have to invade. And somebody asked him, well, what, what happens when uh, uh, we invade? Won't they respond? Oh, I know the Russians. Uh, they're, um, uh, they will respond. And uh, he said, well, well, what do we do then? Well, we, we have to respond, uh, you know, to, to, to whatever they respond to. And somebody else says, well, then what's going to happen? And he said, well, at that point, let's hope that cooler heads prevail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it, it, it's crazy. And remember, uh, these are not notes that somebody took or recollections from a, um, an oral history interview. Uh, Kennedy had a secret recording system in the cabinet room and the Oval Office. And when these meetings took place, we have the transcripts and the voice, voices of all these people speaking. Uh, and 
we know exactly what was said. And we know the historians know better what was said than the people who were saying it because they don't remember exactly what they said. So uh, it's, it's, it's the most extraordinary uh, uh, collection of uh, material in a crisis uh, I, that exists in uh, human history. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, story. Well, among other things, your your research and you know these tapes just demolish much of the existing literature on the Cuban Missile Crisis, beginning with Bobby Kennedy's book Thirteen Days, which is just you know his fantasy uh, of what happened. As as you indicated to me at one point the earlier, he was going to be running for president, so he had to look really good. Uh, but he doesn't look good. He looks rattled. He looks erratic. Uh, he is essentially useless, uh, you know, coming from, from those tapes. Yeah, you know, Bobby Kennedy um, uh, is a particularly interesting uh, character in all of this uh, because uh, he's a different person than we came to believe he was in 1968. And, uh, you know, just like Jack, uh, and I hope, you know, the rest of us, uh, you learn from experience. But uh, Robert Kennedy's experience in 1962 uh, did not lead to wisdom. Uh, he was a uh, very uh, erratic kind of person. Uh, for example, at one point he says, well, uh, maybe we uh, should uh, sink the main again, uh, uh, you know, and to invade Cuba as quickly as possible to have to have an excuse. Uh, on the other hand, when his brother tells him what to do, he does it exactly. So Bobby does play a very important and positive role uh, during the crisis, but the positive role that he plays is the role that Jack tells him what to do. But when Bobby is uh, alone in the room and just giving his opinion, uh, he's one of the leading hawks, uh, you know, rather frequently. You also show that uh, McGeorge Bundy and Robert, Robert McNamara uh, were all over the map too. Uh, and oh, yes. I was uh, not surprised by that, but still uh, it doesn't fit with our understanding of these two uh, people. Uh, uh, right, uh, everybody was all over the map, uh, uh, except for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, they were, from the very beginning, oh boy, this is a great opportunity to get rid of Castro. Uh, they had been trying to get rid of Castro from the get-go. And uh, they pushed 100% for bombing, for invasion. And even at the end of the crisis, on Sunday, October 28th, when Khrushchev announces over Radio Moscow that he's going to accept the arrangement that he and Kennedy have worked out. Uh, General Curtis LeMay, uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff, is furious. He said, this is an outrage. Uh, you know, we can't trust the Russians. Uh, I wanna go see the president. We should invade Cuba right away. You know, the, now the interesting thing about invasion is that um, it would have been a total disaster. The CIA had estimated that the Soviets had 10,000 troops in Cuba. What was the real number they had? 42,000. The CIA did not know that the Soviets had tactical nuclear weapons in Cuba. 
uh, if the 90,000 American invaders had hit the beaches facing 42,000 Soviet troops rather than 10,000 and tactical nuclear weapons, that, which would have blown a lot of them off the beaches, uh, we would have had a global nuclear war. Uh, so, you know, the advice of the Hawks in the XCOM, the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, Kennedy's uh, advisors, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were an absolute disaster. Uh, well, speaking of disasters, one of the things that I just thought over and over when I was reading your book is that American intelligence is really terrible. Uh, they didn't know that that uh, the submarines had uh, nuclear tipped uh, torpedoes. Uh, they didn't know that 42,000 uh, Soviet soldiers were uh, in Cuba. They didn't know that, what was it, 160 uh, nuclear warheads were in Cuba already, something like that. Uh, they didn't know any of this. And so not only would the invasion have been made the Bay of Pigs look, look like a, a picnic, uh, but uh, it seems to me it's the biggest intelligence failure of the Cold War, but I, I, there, there were you know, many candidates for that. But it's just astonishing when we have a, a, a Cuban exile population in Florida where the CIA can pick up you know, agents by the dozen uh, and, and we didn't know what was going on about these crucial yes. things. Yes. No, it, it was exactly what you said, the biggest intelligence failure. Um, you know, uh, and talk about luck again. Um, the missiles were discovered by a U-2 flight over Cuba on October 14th. Uh, prior to October 14th, there were cloud cover over Cuba uh, which prevented uh, a, a U-2 flight. Now, what if the cloud cover had lasted for another week? I mean, this is stormy season. This is October in the Caribbean. Uh, all those missiles would have been ready to fire. Uh, you know, it was, it was just luck. You know, so, you know, again, uh, uh, luck is uh, just one of those things that is absolutely essential to understand in this history. And, you know, when you uh, expand it and think about nuclear deterrence, you know, and the role that luck plays, uh, you know, we're counting on something that uh, is uh, uh, very ephemeral. Uh, I, I think we should, uh, in a few minutes, turn to some of the questions that are coming in. But I, I wanted to ask you about three principal leaders, uh, JFK, Khrushchev, and, and Castro. Uh, previous literature on the Cuban Missile Crisis had convinced me that we were lucky to have JFK as president because you know, ultimately the buck stopped with him and he in the end made uh, wise decisions. Your book actually makes him look even better than I thought. Uh, he often seems to be the only thinking uh, person on the, uh, you know, in these XCOM meetings, uh, the one who is uh, really doping everything out and looking at the consequences. Adlai Stevenson, of course, was another, but that was just you know, over lunch uh, and with his, his proposals that he gave to, to JFK. I still myself don't understand how Khrushchev could have been so uh, uh, bold as to put nuclear tipped missiles in, into Cuba. You can say, well, you know, we had ours in Turkey, uh, but, uh, it's not exactly the same. I mean, Turkey is not a former dependency of the Soviet Union, uh, whereas Cuba was basically our colony until, you know, a semi-colony until 1959. 
And then third, Castro was utterly irresponsible, it seems to me, in, in talking about uh, using tactical nuclear weapons against the US, uh, ones that could hit Miami and, and Charleston and some Southern uh, cities. But then uh, you point out that by the time all the Soviet weaponry was up and running, or if it was up and running, they could hit everything except Oregon and Washington. And I just wonder if you would comment on JFK and Khrushchev and, and Castro. I, I may yes. have asked too long a question, but. Yeah, oh, well, I, no, JFK is so incredibly interesting. Um, uh, one of the um, characters in uh, uh, Gambling with Armageddon uh, refers to him as the great compartmentalizer. Uh, he, he was many different things. Uh, in, initially, uh, he is uh, a cold warrior like the rest of his um, uh, advisors. Uh, his instinct was, well, Khrushchev did this. Uh, we're going to have to bomb and, and or invade. But as, with as Stevenson's uh, input, uh, he begins to think this thing through in ways his advisors do not. And one of the things that's uh, so interesting uh, in terms of how he thinks it through is the questions he asks that none of the other advisors ask. Uh, he constantly says, why did Khrushchev do this? What, the same question you had, why did Khrushchev, uh, what, what brought this about? What is he thinking? Uh, he always wanted to know what his adversary thought uh, not just what was done. And he's trying to um, figure out how to get him to change his mind. And that's why he initiates the blockade. A blockade is an act of war. And Kennedy knows that, of course. But he says that at least that will give him time to think this through. And that's exactly how it works. Um, and the tension over the course of those 13 days is fantastic. And you can feel it in the conversations in the uh, XCOM meetings. Now you asked why Khrushchev did it. Uh, for Khrushchev, the, uh, the nuclear issue became the central medium through which the Cold War was being um, uh, uh, was being played. And that's one of the reasons that the book starts with Hiroshima and carries through the Eisenhower administration. Uh, these nuclear missiles that Khrushchev decided to put in Cuba, uh, did not, you know, come out of the sky, uh, you know, like a meteor. It, they were a process that where they were integrated, starting with Hiroshima and the Truman administration. And the Eisenhower administration is absolutely critical in understanding all of this, because when Eisenhower comes into office, he immediately grabs on to nuclear weapons as the silver bullet. Uh, he initiates massive retaliation, uh, brinksmanship, and he creates the blueprint for Khrushchev's use of nuclear weapons. And what we have is a mirror imaging. Eisenhower does this, Khrushchev does the same. Eisenhower puts nuclear missiles in Turkey. Khrushchev says, well, if they can do it. I can do it. Uh, what's the difference? And they will understand that now there is a balance of fear. And Khrushchev is just 
determined to make this happen. Now, the danger is interesting because his most senior advisor, uh, Mikoyan, says, don't do this. This is really dangerous. And, but Khrushchev just ignores him and says, we're going to sneak them in there. And the Americans will not dare to invade Cuba uh, once those missiles are ready to fire. And then I will announce that we now have this deterrent. Well, that deterrent is what caused the Cuban Missile Crisis and uh, you know, almost led to a nuclear war. And as I point out, you know, nuclear weapons are good for creating the danger that they create, but they're useless for trying to eliminate that danger. And the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis is the most prominent effort to deal with, you know, the danger that nuclear deterrence caused. I just want to add something there because uh, the idea of tactical nuclear weapons was there from the beginning, but they, they, they really only come on stream, so to speak, in the mid 50s. No, the, the, then, the, the medium, medium range and intermediate about range what missiles, you said about it, not uh, tactical. Eisenhower, uh, yeah. Getting back uh, to Eisenhower. And uh, he puts them all over the world. That's uh, right right up against the Soviet border, for example, in South Korea, where there were hundreds of uh, tactical and battlefield nuclear weapons for until 1991. And, you know, I lecture just like you do at, you know, various audiences and four or five times people have come up to me afterwards and said, are you sure we had nuclear weapons in, in Korea? <laughs> I like, no, I made it up actually. I was thinking of something I could make up that would, uh, uh, interest you, you know, and of course, what North Korea has been doing for the last 25 years is is responding, uh, you know, and trying to find a deterrent against this. Yes, uh, which is just very hard, you know, to get across to people. Um, but let me come back finally uh, to Castro because I mean, I when I, I read a few years ago that he had advocated striking the U.S. with nuclear weapons, and and I, I was shocked by it. Khrushchev was also shocked by it. Uh, and and th this story is, uh, 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 takes place on Saturday night, October 27th, known as Black Saturday, because so many terrible things are happening. A U-2 is shot down yeah. over Cuba that afternoon. Uh, another U-2 wanders by a navigation error over Soviet uh, Siberian territory. Um, Castro is convinced that the United States is going to invade. And uh, he sends a letter on Saturday night to Khrushchev saying, if the United States invades Cuba, you should preemptively fire your missiles at the United States. And Khrushchev gets this letter and he says, Castro doesn't understand. I didn't do this to start a war. I did this to prevent the United States from invading Cuba. Um, and uh, Khrushchev by Saturday night sees everything coming apart. The shooting down of the U-2 over uh, Cuba was done by a uh, Soviet uh, surface air missile crew unauthorized. Uh, so he thinks he's losing control over you know, Soviet Jesus. troops and what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and then Castro is saying, start a nuclear war. <laughs> and Khrushchev is, <laughs> oh my God. And he is so panicked that instead of diplomatic through diplomatic channels, uh, uh, telling Kennedy that he will uh, withdraw his missiles uh, from Cuba, he announces it over Radio Moscow to make sure that there's no time delay. 
uh, and yeah. um, and and that's how the Cuban Missile Crisis ends. You know, with the uh, well, you the you also program. show you know the evolution in Khrushchev's thought, where he he gets more and more thoughtful and rational and logical as as the crisis goes on, uh, which is sort of one hopeful thing that we might be able to avoid nuclear war with leaders uh, like this who either you know uh, may start with a dangerous gamble but ultimately realize that it's important to uh, avoid nuclear war we have a bunch of questions and oh i'm sorry Marty, well ahead. i just want to say one thing the critical there was luck in the cuban missile crisis and there was time and that is what you need. You need time to think these things through because all of the plans that are set up for reactions to hostile uh, instances uh, are, are plans that almost invariably will lead to uh, war. And, you know, you got to be lucky to have time. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to turn now to the questions that have come in. Uh, we won't be able to answer them, them all, but uh, I will try to be an arbiter of uh, how many we can answer. I'll try to be brief. Uh, I think um, the first question from Alan Robach is about Castro's role uh, in, in the crisis. And I think we just answered that, that one. Uh, the second question is what happened in 1962 that RFK didn't learn from? That he didn't learn from. Um, Gee, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think what happened in 1962, uh, uh, in retrospect, uh, RFK did learn. Uh, and he tried to uh, uh, describe what he learned by falsifying the history of his participation in the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think that Kennedy, Robert Kennedy learned from the results of the Cuban Missile Crisis that his contributions, his hawkish contributions were way off the mark and that he needed to be more thoughtful like his brother. Thank you. Uh, Hope Ehrman wants to know uh, if it's true that there have been at least two plane crashes in the US of planes carrying nuclear weapons uh, and uh, only fail safe devices uh, prevented, uh, prevented uh, these bombs from going off. Is that true or, or not? Uh, yes, it is true. One, uh, what well, actually one in the U.S. and one in um, uh, in Spain, uh, and uh, those fail-safe devices, Knockwood, uh, were were there were multiple devices, and on one of the instances, uh, every one of the fail-safe devices had failed except for the last one. So yeah, the bomb in Spain was a hydrogen bomb, wasn't it? Yes. So so was the one in the United States. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. I'm not sure how how I. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, Victoria Smith uh, wants to know if you were able to access. Uh, Soviet uh, archives? Uh, yes, there are um, uh, lots of Soviet archives that uh, are uh, are open. Uh, 
The National Security Archive that I uh, mentioned earlier in the program uh, has collected lots and lots of documents from Soviet archives and uh, translated them. Also the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for International Scholars in Washington, D.C. Uh, has done the same thing. Uh, and also my good friend, David Holloway, uh, who was the, the leading scholar of Soviet nuclear uh, history, uh, made a lot of stuff available to me. Uh, can you explain the timing and role of the U.S. missiles in the South Florida area uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, there is a site on display there in the Everglades, which is very interesting. Um, the, the American missiles in South Florida, is, is that what the question said? the timing and role of the U.S. missiles in the South Florida area in the, in the crisis, in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Uh, I, I, as far as I know, uh, and maybe I missed something, uh, there was uh, no role for American nuclear missiles in South Florida. Um, so, so. Okay, next from Bob Slentz, do you believe the creation of low yield nukes uh, would make their use more likely than ICBMs or? Well, I mean, we, we've had tactical nuclear weapons since the very late 1940s. Uh, and, um, you know, Henry Kissinger in his first book, uh, Nuclear Weapons and uh, American Foreign Policy, uh, argued for the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, this was not a very good idea, uh, which he himself realized and three years later wrote another book called The Necessity of Choice, in which he took back the idea of uh, you know, tactical nuclear weapons. But during, as I point out in the, the uh, in gambling with Armageddon, uh, President Eisenhower uh, was very um, enthusiastic, I think is an appropriate word, uh, about using tactical nuclear rep weapons in Korea uh, before the uh, uh, Korean War was resolved. And there's one meeting in the uh, National Security Council uh, where he uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, let's use tactical nuclear weapons uh, because that might get us to the waste, meaning the 38th parallel. Uh, and General Bradley says, no, this is not a good idea that, um, you know, that there are no good targets, there's no necessity for doing it. Uh, and uh, a short time later, Bradley was replaced as the <laughs> chairman of the Joint Chiefs of, <laughs> Chiefs of Staff. Eisenhower was absolutely enamored with the idea of nuclear weapons uh, solving all of his uh, most serious foreign policy uh, uh, issues. Uh, he he uh, was not interested in starting a nuclear war, but he felt that threatening to do that uh, would uh, bring him uh, diplomatic uh, advantages. And he was not adverse to using tactical nuclear weapons if there was a clear advantage uh, to doing such. Rosemary uh, Heileman uh, asks if there is something to be said about the Dulles brothers influence on Eisenhower's Cold War strategy. And I might add to that in your book, uh, Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, uh, comes off rather badly. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger says he was feckless and uh, flighty and so on. Uh, he, he, of course, is mainly responsible for the Bay of Pigs rather than the Cuban Missile Crisis. But anyway, 
I don't know if you have anything to say about either Foster yeah. Dulles or uh, Yes, no, no, I have a lot to say about it, um, uh, but I'll try and say a little. <laughs> uh, 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 the Dulles brothers were absolutely critical during the Eisenhower administration uh, in um, promoting the policies that Eisenhower uh, uh, wanted. Uh, it is not true that Dulles influenced Eisenhower, is that Eisenhower uh, essentially set the agenda and D the Dulles brothers carried him out. Alan Dulles um, overthrowing most of the deck in uh, Iran, uh, promoting that. Then uh, Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. And well, the Bay of Pigs was just, you know, a continuation of Iran and Guatemala. I mean, if those worked out so easily, uh, why wouldn't um, we be able to do the same thing in Cuba? Um, so Dulles, you know, promotes uh, the, the Bay of Pigs. And the important thing about the Bay of Pigs is that if there had been no Bay of Pigs, there probably would have been no Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Kennedy's response during the Bay of Pigs is one of the real clues about um, uh, how he behaves during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Kennedy makes it very clear to the CIA that understand that there will be no American military backup to if, if your invaders fail. I will not send in the Marines. Well, the CIA didn't believe him. You know, what American president could possibly accept that kind of humiliation? Um, but it showed what kind of a spine Kennedy had. Uh, he told them he wasn't going to do it, and he didn't do it. And uh, that tells you an awful lot about how this man thought about, uh, you know, war, peace, and, uh, and policy. Uh, another question has to do with uh, the fire on a Soviet uh, nuclear submarine two years ago. Uh, and uh, I somehow have lost the uh, question, but there was a question about that. And what do you uh, know about that? Uh, the 14 uh, of the uh, sailors were given medals for handling that. And uh, the Russians said, you know, we avoided Armageddon uh, by, because of their actions. Well, I'm, you know, I, th that's true. And, you know, the, the only thing I know about it is what everybody else knows about it, read in the papers. Uh, okay. Uh, John Quinn asks about Adlai Stevenson, uh, what made him an advocate for uh, a diplomatic solution? Was it his temperament, his exposure to alternative viewpoints at the UN? the fact that he wasn't in the XCOM echo chamber. Uh, and for those who may want to learn more about him, do you have recommendations for things we can read? And I would just say, first of all, read Marty's book because uh, it's really the first one. You're, you're the first person, right? First uh, scholar to, to pinpoint Adlai Stevenson's role in this. Am I right about that? Uh, uh, certainly the first scholar to um, make the case that he played a critical role during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis in laying out this uh, diplomatic blueprint. Uh, I'm really glad this, uh, to, to get this quest question because it allows me to, to, to go back a bit. Um, the interesting thing about Stevenson in relationship to Eisenhower, who he ran against in 1952 and in 1956, 
and, and Kennedy also, is that he saw the world differently. He saw the Cold War differently than Eisenhower, Atchison's, Kennedy's, uh, et cetera. And you can see that in the initial reaction. Kennedy's initial reaction is bomb and invade Cuba, just like everybody else. So to the Cold War mindset, Stevenson's initial reaction is diplomacy. This can be worked out. Uh, he says at one point in the memorandum, he writes uh, the following day, uh, the rest of the world will not see this crisis the way we see it. Uh, we have to understand the other viewpoint. And as I said, you know, Kennedy begins during the meetings to say, why did Khrushchev do it? To try to understand the other viewpoint. Um, uh, Stevenson represents the attitude towards the Soviet Union that the United States never followed. Truman, Atchison, Eisenhower, the Dulles brothers, Kennedy, um, you know, represent the American view of how to deal with the Soviet Union. You know, weapons, war, uh, deterrence, you know, all of, all of that. Um, uh, Stevenson's the alternative. I have a couple of quick questions. So uh, what was the name of the Russian who did not launch the missiles? Um, uh, you, you mean on the submarine? Yeah. Uh, Vasily Arkhipov, A-R-K-H-I-V-O, uh, P-O-V. A uh, quick question, but very broad one. Where, where are we today with intelligence, military strategy, uh, uh, et cetera, things seem, more precarious. I, I don't know more precarious than what, but that's what it, the question is. Well, I mean, you know, this is a this is another book, <laughs> but um, uh, I would I would say that um, we are at a crossroad in how to deal with China. There are those who. Uh, have a sensible understanding that China is a competitor, not an enemy, a competitor. And what we have to do is figure out how to best compete economically, uh, et cetera. And then there are those who see China as an enemy, the new Soviet threat, um, and uh, we have to prepare for war with China. Very, very dangerous. And uh, I think that this is the critical foreign policy issue of our time. Uh, Susan McFall uh, asks, you mentioned something about Mr. Sherwin's book about war and TV. What is the name of that book? And that's actually my book. It's called War and Television. Right. right. Uh, I'm glad to get that in. <laughs> I'd be able to sell more than 500 copies of it. Uh, Kevin Lamp, uh, Lamp or Lampy says, my father served on one of the ships in the blockade. Uh, the night they left uh, for deployment on the sea, they all updated their wills. Uh, did Russia ever come close to running the blockade? Um, well, Khrushchev uh, had no intention of starting a war. That's the first thing. Uh, and Kennedy had no intention of starting a war or no wish to start a war. Um, 
uh, Khrushchev uh, turned around all his uh, uh, ships that were carrying critical material. Uh, and there was a cat and mouse game on the blockade line uh, with, the, with the ships. Some were allowed to pass, some were stopped. The danger was not the ships, it was the Soviet submarines, four Soviet submarines that were on the blockade line, each, excuse me, each with a nuclear warhead. And um, uh, that, was, that was the real danger. And I think uh, everybody updating their will was a good idea, fortunately. <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> uh, nothing, nothing uh, like that occurred. Anyway. Chris Wolf has uh, a very interesting question. Can you clarify who was actually responsible for uh, raising the possibility of answering Khrushchev's first letter and ignoring uh, the second one. In your book, you say it is Stevenson, but in other books, the credit is given to Ambassador uh, Llewellyn Thompson. And let me say something about Llewellyn. Uh, Lenny Bruce has one of the funniest riffs I've ever seen on the name Llewellyn. He goes on and on, four L's. I mean, how do you go to the playground with four L's in your name? But anyway, <laughs> side. Uh, Llewellyn Thompson played a critical role. Uh, there's a wonderful exchange, which I quote, between Kennedy and, and Thompson. Um, and uh, here's the framework for it. Uh, on, uh, uh, I think it's Thursday night, uh, Khrushchev sends a letter saying, I will, uh, take my missiles out of Cuba uh, if you promise not to, you, Kennedy, promise not to invade Cuba. Uh, and then the next day, uh, another letter uh, is written, and this one is announced over Radio Moscow. So the whole world knows about it. And Khrushchev says, okay, I'll take my missiles out of Cuba. Uh, if you promise not to invade Cuba and remove the missiles from the Jupiter missiles, uh, intermediate range uh, the missiles from Turkey, which are 130 miles from Soviet territory. Uh, and the whole XCOM is saying, no, we can't do this. We can't do this. Uh, you know, he's threatening us. We're not going to do it with a gun to our head. And Kennedy says, uh, you know, we're not going to have a very good war if uh, the whole world understands that is all we had to do was take these junk missiles out of Turkey uh, and he would take his missiles out of Cuba. And the XCOM said, no, no, we can't do it. And there's a very interesting exchange between Kennedy and Llewellyn Thompson where um, uh, Kennedy is asking Thompson, how can Khrushchev back down on, uh, on that demand, having announced it over Radio Moscow? And Thompson is, who knows Khrushchev quite well, is critical in convincing Kennedy that in some way this can be done. Uh, I personally don't think that he was the first person uh, to get this idea, uh, but this is you know debatable. But Thompson is uh, is, is very critical here. Okay, uh, Joe Bean asks uh, about the results, long term and short term, of Bobby Kennedy's meeting with uh, Dobrynin Saturday night. Yes, well, uh, so Kennedy, uh, this is a good follow-up question to the previous one. Um, so uh, we have a situation where Kennedy's advisors are totally against uh, removing the missiles from Turkey. Uh, Kennedy is alone believing that, look, if this is going to prevent war, let's do it. Uh, and then he figures out, let's see if we can do it secretly. 
So he sends his brother Bobby to Ambassador Dobrinin uh, to tell Dobrinin that the Turkish missiles, the missiles in Turkey will be removed within three months or so, but they can, he cannot, he Khrushchev cannot reveal that this is secret deal uh, has been made. If he does reveal it, he, the Kennedy will deny it. And it, the trust between the two of them will never be, you know, repaired. Uh, so um, Khrushchev accepts this. And uh, that's how the Cuban Missile Crisis is resolved. Kennedy uh, commits to the United States not invading Cuba and secretly removing the Turkish, uh, the American missiles. Well, they're now the they belong to Turkey, the Jupiter missiles from Turkey, and in effect, replacing them with Polaris submarines. Uh, George Wheeler asks uh, if you would comment uh, a bit on the current situation compared to 1962 with regard to the threat of using nuclear weapons. Well, um, uh, I, I don't think there's a comparison because uh, we were at the brink of nuclear war in 1962 if things had gone, you know, wrong, uh, if luck had not uh, been on our side. Um, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the situation is different a lot different than it was during the Cold War with the United States and the Soviet Union um, uh, head to head. Uh, but it is no less dangerous today. I mean, you know, uh, the India-Pakistan situation, uh, you know, I think to underline the most serious, the growing hostility between the United States and China. Um, uh, I think you, you know a lot better than I do about, uh, Bruce, about the North Korean uh, situation. Uh, and if you'd like to comment on that, I'd like to uh, hear about it. Um, but we are in a very dangerous uh, situation uh, with respect to the threat of nuclear war, um, which can sort of break out if a crisis evolves and begins to get out of hand. Um, what about the North Korean situation? Well, uh, I mean, it's uh, been going on for 25 years since 1992 uh, and as I said earlier, it, it fundamentally, whether people like to hear this or not, is a matter of North Korea uh, sooner or later developing a deterrent against the nuclear weapons that the US uh, put into South Korea. And then in recent years, uh, the US has been sending uh, B-2 bombers, nuclear capable bombers uh, near Korean waters uh, as a way of intimidating uh, North Korea. All of this stuff goes on you know, pretty much all the time. Uh, but the American threat against North Korea is almost never mentioned. And I, I, I don't know when I ever heard anybody on CNN or uh, the New York Times or elsewhere uh, talk about the history of our own nuclear emplacements in, in South Korea. Uh, it, it's, it's a very dangerous situation, but the North Koreans, I think, uh, decided not to do what they probably can do, which is to demonstrate that they can marry a nuclear warhead to a, an ICBM uh, and bring that nuclear warhead back through the atmosphere without burning up. Uh, in November, November 2017, they, they blew off an ICBM, clearly capable of, uh, of reaching the US, but they never have demonstrated 
uh, that that they can put a nuclear warhead uh, on top of uh, one of those missiles. And I think they've purposely held off from that uh, so that uh, they don't push the US toward a, a crisis uh, phase. And then all during the Trump administration, they were mainly concerned with uh, Kim Jong-un uh, meeting with Trump as he did three times. There, there was no real diplomacy. It was a kind of photo op on a global scale for Trump. Uh, and right now, as we speak, the Biden administration is working out uh, what it wants to do uh, in regard to North Korea. Uh, but it, it is a very dangerous situation because there's always a, a tripwire along the DMZ there where the US, the US has 28,000 troops still in South Korea. Uh, I have to say it, it is the forever war, uh, more than Afghanistan or, or Iraq. It, it uh, demonstrates how easy it is to get into a war in 1950 and how desperately hard it is to get out. Uh, and it, it's a dangerous situation, but I have to say, apart from the image North Korea has in this country, they have behaved rationally in crises not escalating them and not going ahead with uh, uh, demonstrating their capabilities for putting a, 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 a nuclear warhead on an ICBM. <clears throat> there are a number of que questions or points people are making about what, you know, what kind of weaponry and what kind of emplacement the US you're had in, in South Florida. Uh, and I don't think we need to get into that. Um, this might be, I don't know, I'm not the one keeping time, but uh, uh, I don't want to tax Marty too much. Uh, so this might be the last question. Uh, uh, let let me just jump, jump in, uh, Bruce, and underline something uh, uh, about the Korea. Um, uh, one of the chapters in, in the book talks about Eisenhower's decision, I think it was 1958, to put tactical nuclear weapons into right. South Korea in violation, in vile, clear violation of uh, uh, the agreements that, um, uh, uh, well, the war, Korean War was never ended, but um, yeah. uh, the, the armistice agreement, right. Uh, it was such a clear violation that D John Foster Dulles fought against it for about three months, uh, saying this is such a clear violation of the armistice agreement that it will, you know, harm American, uh, our reputation. But Eisenhower insists that the tactical nuclear weapons be sent to Korea as a way of saving money by pulling uh, American troops out. So, so much for our commitment, you know, to these, to these international agreements. Well, as you anyway, know, last the, question. Uh, as you know, Marty, the Eisenhower Presidential Library has a, an entire file of the National Security Council meetings, which were very lengthy. And, you know, there's a transcript of every, every one of them. And this particular issue goes on for several sessions uh, with Dulles being, you know, a lawyer saying we can't really uh, just ignore uh, Section 13D of the Armistice Agreement uh, and put nuclear weapons in there. And then someone like Admiral Radford, you know, would say, yeah, well, I mean, they've been the North Koreans have been doing uh, MiG 17s, and they're not supposed to have anything more than a MiG 15. And people have to point out that an upgrade on a MiG isn't exactly like putting nuclear <laughs> weapons into the country. Right. Uh, but there, Dulles was one of the only people raising objections to this. It was pretty much unanimous, uh, and and you know that's how they got there. <clears throat> I, I was right. saying there, one more. Uh, very important question that we've touched on, but uh, uh, the question from Susan Sher Sherwin is, why did the Kennedys not properly acknowledge the role that Adlai Stevenson played in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis? 
Well, that, that's really an interesting question because, uh, and, and comes to the personal. It moves from policy to personal. Um, <clears throat> uh, Kennedy, or Robert and John disliked Adlai, Adlai Stevenson uh, for many reasons. One of them was uh, that Stevenson in 56 would not choose Kennedy uh, as his vice president. Um, and they thought that uh, Stevenson was um, uh, uh, hostile uh, to the Kennedys. And Stevenson, in fact, did not think uh, very well of John Kennedy uh, as a potential president. And so there's this tension. And the, the, then the question is, well, why did he pick him for uh, ambassador to the UN? And the reason is Stevenson was the leader of the liberal wing of the Democratic Party, and Kennedy needed to hang on to uh, the liberals who were suspicious of his liberalism. And having Adlai as uh, a member of the administration was essentially protection uh, for John for John Kennedy. I'm going to uh, just continue because we have a number of good questions. When I went through the list, uh, 36 questions. I don't know. We're getting close to the end, but um, Margaret Griff Griffiths uh, wants to know uh, who sent the memo to bomb China that wasn't followed. Uh, by the fellow in Okinawa. Uh, uh, Where did that come from? Uh, it was a major. Uh, um, it was a major uh, whose name I do not recall. Um, uh, who was who either did it by mistake, or he was. Um, uh, you know, sort of an off the wall, uh, uh, dangerous fellow. I um, kind of thought, I don't, I don't know if you said this in your book, but when I read, read about this incident, uh, I mean, it occurred to me that American global war plans at the time were just to hit all the communist countries, especially uh, Russia and China right. in the general war. Uh, and I, I just wondered if you know, somehow they, they thought, well, if we're about to fight uh, Russia, we better hit China too. I don't know. Well, there, there, was, there was that thinking in some parts of the American military establishment. Uh, and the so-called PSYOP, the Strategic Integrated Operational Plan, uh, which uh, PSYOP 62, uh, which um, uh, was the plan for how would we how we would respond to a, uh, a, a Soviet provocation, uh, uh, just was bombing every communist country. Uh, you know, the Soviets did this. But, well, the Chinese are communists too, so we're going to bomb them also. Um, uh, it, it was, re it's really crazy, really crazy. With that, our friend, uh, Kenneth Benedict uh, has a question. Kenneth was a former uh, director of the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, could you talk about the role of Utant in communicating between the US and Soviet Union during the crisis? Oh, I'm so glad that uh, that question was asked, because I think that um, the UN played an absolutely critical role. Not only Adlai Stevenson's um, uh, ambassadorship, you know, there, uh, but what the UN did was make this crisis a international public. Uh, event. Uh, it was played out in, during the uh, second week after Kennedy's uh, announcement of the blockade on October 22nd. It was played out on the world stage. And because it was played out on the world stage, 
Uh, the United Nations, uh, in effect, made both Khrushchev and Kennedy, both the Soviet Union and the United States, behave more cautiously uh, in terms of uh, dip diplomacy uh, and in important ways, uh, the UN itself and Utah in particular, by acting as a middleman between Khrushchev and Kennedy, uh, played a critical role in bringing the crisis to resolution uh, for resolution. Very important. Well, thank you. And Mr. Cummings, unless you see another question that is absolutely needs to get out there, uh, this may be a good time to wrap up. Fine. Um, and may I just say, Mr. Sherwin, Mr. Cummins, thank you for your insight and the discussion. It's a pleasure for me to see, you know, friends uh, bringing their knowledge and their insight uh, to bear and letting us watch. It's 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 a marvel.